Welcome to the easier way to sell presentation of Close the Deal Without Selling. Here's your host and developer of the easier way to sell, Ike Krieger. Hey, this is Ike Krieger. Welcome back. Let me give you an idea of what we're going to be covering over the next few podcasts, starting with this one, of course. In this episode, we're going to look back at both scenarios of Pam's sales experience. And you'll remember that in the before setting, Pam didn't have access to the easier way to sell, so she couldn't employ the ingredients of the yes formula. We'll review her less than successful meeting with Victor and compare it with its happy ending counterpart. Now, in the first illustration, Pam uses a traditional selling approach, and this style of selling produces results that are random and inconsistent. The meeting ended with the words no salesperson wants to hear, ever. Those words are, maybe, or I need to think it over. Weigh the result produced by Pam in that first scenario against the successful sales meeting in the second The yes formula makes selling easier. Just keep in mind the letters Q-U-I-C-K. First off, we'll focus our attention on the nuts and bolts of the Q section. You really need to learn the language used by Pam and her qualification of Victor. What Pam says is virtually the same thing you'll say when you qualify your prospects. Now, in upcoming episodes, you'll be guided through a complete analysis of the entire quick system, including exact language and appropriate questions. And I know you've been waiting to learn the entire system, and you're almost there. There's still a bunch to cover, and this vital information will be spread out over the next few episodes. Stay focused on installing all the information you've learned up till now, and keep practicing. Section 9 of the Action Guide will help you learn quick and the entire yes formula, but right now, we're going to take a closer look at another very important component of success. It's one we've mentioned, but we haven't focused on it yet. I'm talking about listening. Author Stephen Covey says most people don't listen with an intent to understand. Most people listen with an intent to reply. Here's another quote by someone a bit less well-known, Wilson Misner. And for the purposes of our system and the purposes of active listening, he nails it. A good listener is not only popular everywhere, but after a while, he knows something. We'll probably never find out where along the line the name of the author of this next piece got lost, but you'll find that this poem of sorts, apparently written in the late 20th century, hits home on the psychological, the communications, and the human level. It will be interesting to find out what you get from the following, appropriately titled, Listen. Listen. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving advice... You've not done what I've asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you're trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problems, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen. All I ask is that you listen, not talk or do. Just hear me. Advice is cheap. 25 cents will get you both Dear Abby and Billy Graham in the same newspaper. I can do things for myself. I am not helpless. Maybe discouraged and faltering, maybe lonely and isolated and grieving and searching, but not helpless. When you do something for me that I can do and need to do for myself, you contribute to my fear and to my weakness. But when you accept as a simple fact that I do feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can quit trying to convince you and you can get about the business of understanding what's behind this irrational feeling. And when that's clear, the answers are obvious and I don't need advice. Perhaps that's why prayer works sometimes for some people, because their God is mute and doesn't try to give advice or try to fix things. He just listens and lets you work it out for yourself. 
So please listen and just hear me. And if you want to talk, wait a minute for your turn and I'll listen to you. So if you're liking what you're hearing and you find it useful, I'm inviting you to tell your friends, colleagues, and other associates about the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast. Let them find out about this easier way to sell or let them look at it as a communications model that'll help them achieve their outcomes through language in their day-to-day -day life. The Close the Deal Without Selling podcast is available on all major distributors such as Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple, TuneIn, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. And I almost forgot to tell you that you could have access to the podcast by going directly to our website, CloseTheDealWithoutSelling.com. Before we focus on what Pam actually said and the effect of those words, I'm going to share with you a communications model. I based quick on this communications model called the public speaking model. This model is a format that helps create and deliver an effective speech. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Once again, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. This is the way quick works. You tell people what you're going to be discussing. You then discuss it. And after you finish, you then round up all of your facts and information and clarify that you heard what you thought you heard. That's the public speaking model at work. Okay. Let's go back and look at exactly what happened in Episode 5. We had a scenario, a before sales call, and an after sales call. The before sales call, there was no use of the yes formula. It was more or less a traditional call with what I believe are the horrors that can be produced by a traditional call. Maybes, I want to think about it. It's don't call us, we'll call you. Giving presentations when no one listens. You give a great presentation, they still don't buy. Everything that causes frustration when you go out to market or sell yourself, your products, or your ideas. Part two, however, uses the yes formula. And what we're going to do now is go over each and every step Pam used to establish her mutually beneficial agreements, the rules for her communication with Victor. And... All of these rules were agreed to before the tour even started. Upon completing the cue section of Quick, in which you tell your prospect what to expect, like in the public speaking model, you begin your full sales examination, which Pam started promptly once they reached the shop area. The first and maybe the most important of all the MBAs is what I call the prelude. The prelude provides the first set of MBAs in the Q section of the yes formula. I'd like you to memorize the following. I don't know yet if I can be of service to you because I don't have enough information, but if it's okay with you, I have a few questions and you might have some to ask of me and based on my experience, Within the next few minutes, we'll know whether or not there's a reason to move forward. Is that an okay way to start? Now, I want you to read your prelude out loud over and over again. I'm including it in the show notes. The prelude represents the first of many authentic communications with your prospect. Let's face it. You really don't know whether or not the prospect is interested in your product or service, or even if they may really need it. You have your opinion. You have your truth. However, their truth might not be the same as yours. Begin your communication by stating the undeniable truths contained in the prelude. If the prospect agrees to the MBAs contained in the prelude, it's time to share all the steps of quick. Now, it's time to establish the ground rules for the conversation. 
Remember, we as humans have a tendency to get upset with people because they did things we didn't tell them they weren't allowed to do. Let me repeat that. We get upset with people for doing things we didn't tell them they weren't allowed to do. You may have just chuckled when you heard that because you know how accurate that is. An example of this in sales is how much we hate it when after a great presentation, a prospect tells us, maybe, or I want to think about that. We've all come to realize that when someone tells us maybe, or I want to think about it, it's usually a polite substitute for no. One of your rules has them agree to avoid both of those responses. No maybes, no I want to think about it. Now, why would a prospect agree to a request such as that? They would agree because it's mutually beneficial. Here's how to proceed with the setting of the rules. You've just completed the prelude and they've given you permission to proceed with your communication. Thank them and say, and if anywhere along the line you come to the conclusion that what we offer is not what you're looking for, how comfortable are you telling me that? In other words, are you okay telling me no? They'll usually respond that they're comfortable giving you a no. Continue by saying, obviously, I'd prefer a yes, but if it is a no, I'd rather hear that than a maybe or I want to think about it. I've noticed that in most cases, when someone tells me maybe or I want to think about it, it's usually a polite substitute for what? Now here, I want you to wait for the answer. W-F-A, wait for answer, and they will almost always reply, no. Respond by agreeing and assure them. Of course, if you truly need more information or time, you're most welcome to it. I just want to avoid maybe or I want to think about it as a substitute for no. You now let them know what's covered in each of the remaining portions of the system, starting with you. Uncover the problem. And here's what you can say. If it turns out that you have the type of challenges or issues that you believe my product or service can resolve, and you're going to be the judge of that, we're going to have to take a look at what type of dollars you've set aside to resolve these issues. How comfortable will you be sharing that amount in ballpark figures only? They'll either say okay, or they will obfuscate. In the case of the latter, assure them that whatever their choice in sharing those numbers, they can decide in the moment. They can decide later on. You can say to them, I just didn't want to catch you off guard if I started to ask about budget later in the conversation. C is capability, and that's the capability of your prospect to make the decision to spend the money to solve the problem. Also, if you decide that what we offer is what you're looking for, who besides yourself would be involved in the decision to move forward, or are you comfortable making that decision on your own? If they say others are necessary for the decision, ask them, what would you have to find out in our meeting that would cause all the decision makers to gather? When it's a no, or in other words, this person can make the decision on their own, verify. Verify that no additional decision makers are necessary by asking rhetorically something uh, appropriate for their business, such as no partners, board members, accountants, or attorneys. In some cases, you might say no spouse, no significant other. It all depends on your prospect. Finally, the K for knowledge. And either way, if you choose to move ahead with us or not, I'd be interested in knowing the reason behind your choice. How willing are you going to be to share that information with me? W-F-A. Great. You then ask with a big smile on your face, do you want to go first or should I? You've just completed the Q phase of the yes formula. You've clarified the ground rules. You've clarified what the conversation you're about to have will contain. You've set the guidelines for your communication. And you've given the prospect implied control over the upcoming communication. 
If the prospect agrees to go along with these simple guidelines, you can begin the second step of the process, which is to go over each of the remaining sections of QUIC in the form of your sales examination. You've just heard me mention implied control. How does implied control fit into the yes formula? Well, I heard the following story at a meeting of sales and marketing executives international, and I believe this clarifies implied control perfectly. Imagine that you're driving through life in a metaphorical two-seat car. There's a driver's seat and there's a passenger seat. The people in attendance were asked, as a salesperson, in which of the two seats would you prefer to sit? Would you prefer to sit in the driver's seat or the passenger seat? Nearly everyone in the room responded that they would prefer to sit in the driver's seat. This question was asked next. In which seat do you think the prospect would like to sit? Well, nearly everyone in the room responded that the prospect would prefer to sit in the driver's seat. Since both parties wanted to sit in the same seat, an immediate level of conflict was created. It was agreed that both parties wanted to sit in the driver's seat because each believed the person in the driver's seat is the one in control of this metaphorical journey. Just the opposite is true. Give up the driver's seat. Let the prospect sit where they want. If the prospect sits in the driver's seat, that means that you will be sitting in the passenger seat. At first glance, this may appear as a negative. But remember your new role in the sales process. You're now a magical problem solver. What responsibility can you assume while sitting in the passenger seat that will allow you to function as a magical problem solver? The answer is to assume the role of navigator. Navigators help people get to their destination. If the prospect knew how to get to their destination on their own, they would get there. But since they can't, don't know how to, or don't want to go it alone, they're looking for someone they like and they trust who can guide them to their outcome or destination. Now, most salespeople prefer the driver's seat because they believe that it affords them more control over the prospect. You can never control the prospect. The only thing over which you have control is the communication. In this case, the communication itself is the journey. Another powerful and positive byproduct of moving into the passenger seat is that it gives you the option of getting out of the car if you're not thrilled with the destination. In other words, you can say to the prospect who's driving the car, uh, could you please let me out at the next corner? Since you're the guide on this journey, the one doing the driving has only implied control rather than actual control. Remember that the problem you're trying to solve is the problem of the prospect. The system is about controlling the communication, not the prospect. Your commitment in this communication exercise is to help them get to the destination to which they want to get. This is vastly different than trying to get them to a destination to which you would like to get them. Give up the driver's seat. Take on the role of navigator. Based on that last segment, here's a little something I'd like you to think about. The one doing the talking is usually perceived as the one who controls the communication. Just the opposite is true. The person who listens and asks questions controls the communication. The person doing the talking usually dominates. Well, that completes another episode. And what I'd like you to do this week is concentrate on, well, not only memorizing your prelude and really becoming ultra familiar with the YES formula and all of its ingredients, but I'd like you to concentrate on your listening this week. See if you can really focus in on being effective at listening rather than talking. Remember, 
many times you should be receiving rather than broadcasting. A good way to maintain a great listening average is to remember the 80-20 rule. Listen at least four times more than you talk. This is Ike Krieger. See you next time.